for taking the time today uh, to kind of go over the Dayton project. Uh, Bridges of Pine Creek is the name of it. Uh, and uh, and give us your, your current update and maybe current situation report on the project. But uh, uh, my I first question for you, I think, is uh, the question that probably is first on everybody's mind, and it's why Dayton? Why would an <laughs> up-and-coming, well, at that time, uh, real estate investment firm like yourselves choose such a daunting project in such an obscure market? Um, same reason we did Puerto Rico. <laughs> um, well, some of it is just about where there's opportunity. For people who've been in the real estate market for a while, uh, they'll know that um, a lot of the sales of the best properties happen off market. They're, they're traded from, you know, one investor to another who've known each other. They're all in their 60s. They've been doing this, you know, since they were in their 20s or 30s. And, um, you know, some of the best inventory is, is off market deals and they're all relationship driven. So sometimes you look at properties and that's exactly what happened in, in Dayton, Ohio. You look at properties in markets that weren't on your radar. Um, because you have a relationship and you have access to to a deal at the right price. At the end of the day, it's the market. Obviously, the location is important, um, but equally important is getting into a deal at the right cost basis. And so, um, at almost every market has a price that makes it make sense to take a look at it. Um, and to be honest, we kind of got lucky a little bit with the Midwest. Um, you know, it, it was not, you know, the top market of everyone's focus, but, but usually top markets are pretty efficiently priced um, and you can't go to get as good deals um, in those in those markets. Um, so when we moved forward on Dayton, it was, um, uh, there were some good fundamentals. Um, we liked that the Midwest um, did not have the same huge downturn in the recession that the coast did, that Arizona did, that Florida did, that, that um, Nevada did. Um, it was it's, it tends to be much more stable. It doesn't have the big, big upswings either, um, but it tends to be very consistent. So that was appealing. Um, having um, access to an off-market deal was appealing. Um, and um, as we've come to find out, like I said, we've actually been fairly blessed um, that that particular sub-market demographic um, is doing quite well. Um, cap rates are compressing all along the, the uh, coasts of the U.S., and um, big institutional capital has been turning to the Midwest as a place to put money, um, and we got in at a much, much – I mean, we were buying that thing. I think we bought it at a 12 or 13 cap, um, and, you know, now they're looking at, you know, seven, eight. Um, and that's just because of some of the strong – fundamentals of, of, of the Midwest marketplace. You know, again, it's not, you know, ever going to be a huge rally of growth, but it tends to not have the huge downturns either. So stability. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a, that, that, that's a, that's, I like that. How, you said this was an off market deal. How did mm -hmm. it present itself to you? And uh, I understand that, you know, there were a lot of people that had looked at it before you did. Yes, there were a lot that have looked at it. Um, they had had it listed on the market, but they had it priced very, very high um, probably two years before. So, uh, so a little bit about the backstory on this project. Um, this, the, our seller, um, the owner of the property, had gotten this asset as well as many, many more throughout the U.S. as part of a negotiated um, bank debt uh, play. So they, uh, their business was buying bank defaulted bank debt on foreclosed properties and then just turning around and, and selling them to people like myself who fix up properties and, and whatnot. Um, so the seller had never been to the property. They didn't know the, the property or the project at all. Um, and I actually found out about it through a phone call um, with one of the – so the seller was made up of a, a group of investors, and one of those investors I knew personally, and I called him for some – uh, some personal advice, actually, um, about another deal and another situation. And, um, you know, he he mentioned that he had this one available and the things kind of went from there. Um, we, uh, you know, 
at the end of the day, I was going to walk away from this one too. Um, and they were able to make the price favorable enough that it made sense. And, and also because of the relationship, um, provide some seller financing, um, during the intensive early construction process where it would be really hard to get bank debt or where it would be uh, very costly to carry, you know, private capital interest rates. Um, so, so that helps uh, move the needle to make the project make sense. Terrific. I understand there have been some challenges on this project, uh, in particular a fire the day after closing. Uh, how yeah. have you dealt with those challenges and uh, what other challenges have you had so far? Yeah, that was fun. Um, I was eight and a half months pregnant and just got into the office and got a call from our contractor to turn on the news. Our building was on the news. Um, definitely the first time I'd ever experienced that. And, and add to it, our lender um, who was going to do the construction loan happened to be doing their walkthrough that that moment as well. So that was the first time they'd ever been on site when a building uh, burnt down. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, honestly, in all transparency, I freaked out a little bit at first, um, but it didn't take very long to go to the spreadsheet and begin to plug in the numbers and see, you know, what that would do to the pro forma if we had less units and if we had less units we had to renovate and, um, you know, how that would all kind of play out. And uh, it, it actually worked out pretty well for us. Um, unexpectedly so. So once I could kind of take the emotion out of it and just think about it in terms of dollars and cents and as an investment, it really wasn't a big deal. Um, and that's, that's really how all the challenges get dealt with. Um, you know, whether it's a delay or a misrepresentation from somebody that, that you know, affects the budget or management issues or whatever, um, I will say that part of the reason we've navigated through this and, and I think navigated through it so well is, is because it's not just me solving those problems. We have an amazing team. Um, you know, e each person has a respective resume and, and years of experience in their own right and collectively um, it, it makes us feel pretty good about attacking um, situations that, that most people may not may not be up for. Um, but but overall, um, we've made good progress. I mean, that area, quite frankly, there were drugs, there were shootings, there was prostitution, there was a lot of um, negative things on that property. And, and since we've taken over, it's really turned around. Um, there's still work to do, but at this point, um, the main sort of energy shift has happened, and it's just about completing units and getting more residents in. But we're attracting the right kind of people, and uh, we've already begun to make a difference in that community, so it's really exciting. So from that perspective, it sounds like maybe there was some sort of social shift in Dayton that occurred that maybe made this project possible where you may not have taken it on before? Is that is that what I'm understanding? Um, certainly in the larger Dayton demographic, there's some movement happening. Um, you know, the, we have the university nearby. There's a hospital nearby. There's, there's more and more employment happening. Um, the city has done a great job of focusing energy on fixing up what they call the corridors, you know, so the main entrances into the city, um, infrastructure investment, and, and just, you know, cleaning things up, making them look nice, making sure they're policing. We've also had a wonderful joint venture with the Dayton Police Department, who's really stepped up and, and supported community policing and being proactive. Um, a lot of times in these communities, they spiral downward because, um, you know, nobody's, it sounds crazy, but when you live in a, a safe community, you know, the cops are there when you litter. Um, and and they're not, you know, locking you up, but they're pointing out that we don't do that in this town. And um, it, that's an important function. You know, if the police just show up a day after a robbery and take a report, um, things just get worse. And so the police have been really, really helpful in helping to, to support the demographic there. You know, we haven't changed anything. We've just created an environment to facilitate what that community already wanted. 
Um, the school behind us was already doing a lot to help the kids and, and do educational programs for the parents, and resume training and vocational training. And so we've just tapped into the spirit that's already there and um, given it a little more oxygen. So I understand you have a few of your own innovative programs um, for for the tenants on site also, not just the school behind you, but uh, you guys have taken some, some initiative on your own. Um, yes, absolutely. So um, number one, we have um, we have a program called Dream. Um, it's an acronym. It stands for Direct Revenue uh, Direct Revenue Earnings Acceleration Model. So um, it, it, these are programs and services we add onto a property or a project um, that not only help improve the bottom line, but also um, do so by supporting and making an impact um, on the residents. So whenever we move into a property, we really look at like who's here, who's the demographic of people who are living here, and how can we support them? Um, is that providing work from home opportunities? Is that providing after school support for kids? Is that um, providing, you know, easier access to laundry facilities, um, healthy, you know, meals for seniors on the complex. Um, so whatever is appropriate for that particular community, um, we layer on those programs. And we also look, again, to leverage what's already in existence with the nonprofits in the area. So if there's vocational education and training, you know, we want to make rooms available, classrooms available for them to do that on site. Um, so we, you know, we bring those types of programs um, as needed and as 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 uh, desired by the residents, um, and as available as another profit center. Um, we bring we bring those in as well. So, I, I like where you're headed here in terms of social and an impact on the tenants. But is that what makes it possible for you to be successful? in an area that most investors write off as Section 8. Uh, I'm referring mostly to the social economy of the area. As I understand it, Bridges of Pine Creek doesn't market specifically towards Section 8. Yeah, we don't have, I don't, I don't believe we have any Section 8 uh, residents on that property um, any longer. There were some when we first took it over. Um, but we are, um, so I, I should back up a little and, ex and kind of explain that fundamentally, um, you know, we are a, a libertarian organization in our thinking and in our approach, and um, we look for free market solutions to problems. Um, and one, I think, major misconception about capitalism or, or libertarianism or, or conservatism sometimes is that um, it's all about the profit or it's all about just the individual. Um, and that's really not true. Uh, it's more that, like, we believe that through measuring profit and through supporting the individual, it helps the collective. Um, and so, you know, we've really focused on empowering and teaching people um, how to have what they want. Um, they want it. I mean, these communities have people in them who want to take the next step and just like our investors I mean our investors are people who are at a particular economic echelon and they want to take it to the next level our tenants are the same you know they're at a certain spot and they want to take it to the next level and and really in a sense um, the shift that it takes to do that the, the mental shift and the support that's needed to take someone to the next level um, in their own life is um, it's the same. So, you know, the same thing that, that our investor development people are doing with our investors on the phone every day, our on-site management and staff are, are doing with our, our, our tenants every day. Um, we're, you know, so we're not necessarily bringing in new residents. We're, we're, we're attracting the cream of the crop within that community that was already there. Intriguing model. Uh, I understand that there may be some other innovative programs that are focused more on your net operating income uh, that maybe are are not a social program like uh, uh, like like the Dream Program or, or the th other things that you mentioned with the local police, but things that maybe DSW has done different uh, from other investment groups. 
Um, yeah. Uh, so one of our, I won't go into a ton of detail here because some of this is proprietary and, and the marketplace is getting incredibly competitive. So, um, you know, 10 years from now, I'm sure we'll write a tell all book. Um, <laughs> but right now, while we're in the middle of it, I'll just simply say that, you know, we've really focused on, um, new ways to maximize res residential square footage, um, and tap into uh, social business enterprise in a way that allows us to revenue share with multiple different uh, businesses and, and ultimately have that trickle down into the net operating income of the property. Um, so we're measuring what we call the double or even triple bottom line. So uh, double bottom line is looking at social impact as well as financial impact uh, triple bottom line includes the environmental impact. Um, and generally what we find is is when a policy is good, it serves all things beneficially. Maybe not all to the same degree, um, but when we have a good policy, we're going to have less of an impact on the environment, we're going to have a better social impact, and we're going to reduce expenses and increase revenue. Um, and so our goal is to find where those three things come together. Um, and you hear the word impact investing thrown around a lot. And I was actually watching a video the other day that was pretty good, but this guy sort of glibly was like, oh, millennials, you know, they want to make an impact, whatever that means. Um, and, uh, you know, they, it really wasn't fair because we do want to make an impact. And what it means very specifically is about measuring um, social quality of life, you know, quantitative and qualitative factors about quality of life. Um, for your client, for your resident, uh, measuring your economic, uh, or sorry, your uh, environmental uh, impact in terms of uh, resources you're drawing down versus resources you're contributing, whether that's through, uh, you know, having farming available in an urban apartment complex like we do, have um, you know, community garden spaces, um, or having higher energy efficient um, thermostats and appliances. Uh, which a lot of owners don't do because if they don't pay the utilities, why do they care? Um, but we do care because we want to. We still want to know our impact there, and then of course measuring our bottom line financial impact. So you know we're looking at the way that all of those three things converge, and where policies can allow us to reduce our environmental impact, increase our social impact, and increase our bottom line. Thank you. You know, there's a lot of other multifamily projects in the area. Uh, tell me a couple things about maybe what sets yours apart. Are you worried that someone's going to steal your model, you know, create a newer and safer complex, and then steal your tenants? No. Um, number one, I don't come from a spirit of uh, someone's going to steal something from me in general. Um, you know, we're pretty open in terms of sharing ideas and information. I mean, even things that I'm not willing to kind of go into detail on on this call, if a specific investor in that community had some specific questions and called me directly, I'd be happy to tell them what we're doing. You know, um, we, I truly believe a rising tide rises all, uh, rises all ships and that a cooperative and competitive environment creates the best possible outcome for everybody. Um, so, you know, if somebody wants to come in and do what we're doing, that's, that's all well and good. And I think it'll just attract, um, and elevate, um, the overall population. I think it'll be a good thing. Um, I will say that I think that if others wanted to do it, they'd be doing it and they're not doing it. Um, and they're not doing it for a number of, of sort of systemic reasons. Number one, um, a lot of the capital that comes into multifamily real estate is institutional capital. So the manager is managing the capital, making those decisions. Um, it's one, it's not their money. Um, two, they're, they're paid on uh, bonuses based on, you know, tiny fractions of outperformance. Um, and so they're going to make decisions that, uh, are more immediately focused on maximizing returns uh, quarter after quarter after quarter. Um, and that tends to lead to wearing down and dilapidating assets and then doing a 1031 exchange and buying a new asset and wearing it down and then buying a new asset. Um, it's a model. 
it's a model that many, many institutions use. Um, because we're a group of co-investors and because we buy with a long-term eye, we make smart long-term decisions. We build assets um, right um, as if we're going to own them for our kids' kids' kids. Um, that reduces our operating expenses. Sometimes it can be a little more expensive up front, um, but, you know, we're not in this for the quick quarterly turn um, because I know that big picture, that really doesn't work. Eventually, you have to pay the piper. Um, and so our, our, our investor model allows us to think differently um, and therefore have a different product. Um, and so I don't think it's likely that, um, you know, many people are going to come in and sort of replicate what we're doing because they just think about what we're doing differently. Intriguing. Is there a um, a particular? Well, let's let's jump over economically for a second. And you're talking about you know essentially a tri merge of things that come together both socially and impactfully speaking and economically speaking, what are you doing um, both actively and systemically to protect your investors and, uh, more importantly, this investment? Yeah. Um, I mean, just getting really specific, um, this might not sound like much unless you've done much construction, but um, when we went in and redid all of the electrical work and all of the underground plumbing and, and everything in these properties, um, we built in easy access uh, main drains into each section of the complex. So one of the things that happens, um, you know, a lot of toilets get backed up in apartment complexes. It just happens. Um, and so maintenance has to schedule. They have to go into the house. They have to uh, interrupt the tenant. Um, maybe another tenant in another unit. Um, by doing this and the way we structured it, thinking ahead, you know, it costs literally in the tens of dollars more per, you know, per section of units to do this. Um, but ultimately, it will save us money in terms of maintenance costs um, and time in dealing with um, ongoing maintenance issues. Um, so that's the kind of investment that happens up front that ultimately is going to translate to a higher net operating income um, as we own and operate the property. And, and ultimately, if and ever we sell it, um, a better sale price. So how are you calculating the value of the project as of today? And what does yep. that mean for the investor? Um, so there's, there's sort of two calculations. Um, and I should explain, and, and, you know, for those that don't really know, in commercial real estate, the primary driver of a value is the cap rate. The cap rate's based on the net operating income. So essentially, like a business, when you buy it versus like buying a house, um, the documented, provable net operating income is the strongest negotiating point for determining a value of a property. So on a newer asset like this, it will take some time to document all of these incomes as we're bringing in more residents and adding more service revenue and all of that kind of stuff. So it will take some time to really be able to substantiate to the outside world um, the, the highest economic value of the asset. The second way that they're determined, though, is, is building costs. Um, so one of the beauties of this property is that it's this old, beautiful brick structure, well-made, great bones. Everything else had to go. Um, but just doing that, um, the insurance value alone to rebuild the complex um, came in at $22 million. Um, if we were to take a conservative estimate, so right now they're building new buildings in this area around $100,000 a unit. If we took even half that and said this is worth you know, $50,000 a unit, um, you know, we're in the $17, $18 million valuation range. Um, and then as we can substantiate the net operating income, um, that'll put us also somewhere around the uh, 16 to $18 million range as that gets substantiated. Um, so that's the total value of the complex stabilized at completion for the whole complex. As we move through the phases, um, we have it down pretty well to know 
that essentially each unit costs about $20,000 to complete. And when it's done, it's worth anywhere from forty to $50,000, right? Again, using those numbers I shared before about new construction costs, cap rate. Um, so every time we spend $20,000 in a draw, um, we're adding, let's call it $40,000 to the value of the property. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about participating in a project like this as it goes along, is that um, every time you contribute to a draw investment, you know, each month you submit additional capital, um, that money is um, being used to pay work that was done um, 30 or 60 days ago. So the work has already been done, the value has been added for the property, and then we pay for it. Um, so it's a pretty um, secure way of saying, okay, I, I know that I'm, I'm putting money into something, and I know it's worth more already than, than what I'm putting in. Cool. Who are the investors that are on the project so far? I mean, you don't have to name names, but sure. you know, where where do they come from? Uh, you know, doesn't seem like everyone can do this. So um, there's two types of investors. We have equity investors who um, are going to stay in this project with us after the construction and when we refinance, and and, and they'll continue to receive cash flow uh, even after they get their capital back. Um, but they're getting a lower cash flow amount right now. In fact, they're getting no cash flow right now. Um, but when it starts to produce income, it'll sort of ramp up. So less money up front, longer, money for longer. That's the equity play, plus some, some other benefits of equity. Um, the other type of investor is the lender investor who's in that, that lean position and um, is getting a monthly interest payment direct deposit into their checking account. Um, and quite frankly, our investors don't generally, they're not real estate people. Um, I mean, a lot of them have real estate investing experience, but they're not, they're not real estate agents or brokers or whatnot. Some of them, some of them certainly are. But by and large, most of our investors are, um, you know, vice president and senior level executive staff um, at Fortune 500 companies, at technology companies, at oil and gas companies um, that are looking, are, are quite frankly no longer comfortable with the stock market and are looking for ways to leverage either their IRA or 401k or, or, just, or just cash savings um, into something that's tangible, um, something that's measurable. Uh, every investment still comes with risk. Um, but, I, but to me, the risks in real estate are much easier to manage um, than the risk, especially when you buy things that are to produce cash flow and add economic value, um, than the risks that are sort of out of your hands when it comes to investing in the stock market. So, you know, they're just average people. I mean, I, I've met investors of ours on airplanes. Um, I've met investors of ours. Uh, one time I made a wrong turn and pulled into someone's driveway and got my car stuck in the snow and, uh, you know, went and asked them for help and they invest with us now. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, they're just, they're regular people just like us, um, that, uh, are looking for a better alternative. I see. So currently speaking, I mean, you guys have been in this project for quite some time. Why would an investor get in now? I mean, what oh, yeah. advantage compared to now, compared to last year, and or 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 next year, for example, oh. when more yeah. of the work done? Yeah. So if it wasn't for our, our investors who've done a lot of other deals with us over the last few decades, I don't think we'd have gotten where we are because the earliest investors sort of take the most risk, so to speak, in that you know nothing's been done yet. <laughs> so you're buying this dilapidated old building with the hopes and dreams that it's going to be worth something someday. Um, and then the further you get down, the more it becomes the scenario I told about where it's like, okay, we've done all the common area stuff. We own the complex. We've amortized the cost basis over all these units. Now, every time we complete another unit, we put a tenant in there and we just added value to the property, right? It becomes much more cookie cutter at this point. Um, the difference between getting it now versus getting in three months from now, six months from now, um, it's really how long you want to make the return. Um, you know, if you have the cash available, um, you know, we're over the highest risk hurdle um, on this project. 
And so now's a great time to start making that cash flow. Um, if you wait, you know, another three or six months, you're getting closer to the maturity date and um, you're, just, you're just not going to make the money for as long. And what I'm already seeing happen is, um, you know, returns are coming down a bit as the market has heated up. It's getting harder and harder to have the, the margins necessary to pay 12, 15, 20%. So, uh, so if, if people have the cash available, um, make, make that return now while you can um, and for as long as you can. Um, because, you know, when you turn, go to turn the money into the next deal, it, it may not be um, quite as, as lucrative, you know. So there's just, there's just really strong returns because we got into this deal, you know, when the market was still much lower. So we have the margin to do that. Let's explore that just for a second. Uh, let's just say there's a market correction in 2017, and uh, the value of multifamily is affected, or perhaps the interest rates that we're seeing tick up a little, uh, tick up a little more. How's that going to affect you at the Bridges of Pine Creek? Um, well, the nice thing is we underwrote this deal at a six percent interest rate. So um, the last deal we did, we got a quote at four point two five. Um, so we we have a lot of room um, in rates before I'm worried about that. Um, so that's good. Um, you know, I, I do think that we're going to start to see some markets correct. Um, but I want to clarify that, you know, a market correction, as if the whole U.S. real estate market is going to do some one thing, that's a conversation of the past. Um, that's just not going to happen that way. Um, sub markets that have really, really heated up and have been overbuilt and overdeveloped are getting ready to correct. Markets like the Midwest are just starting their recovery from the last recession. So um, we're seeing a much more um, segmented sub-market population throughout the U.S. And, um, you know, I think there's still a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of room for, for the real estate to move. Um, additionally, because we bought in, like I said, at a 12 cap, even if even if cap rates come back up from where they are right now, which is you know anywhere from maybe a six and a half on the on the best case to a seven and a half in the, or eight on the worst case, even if they came up to a nine or a ten, um, we're still sitting very very well. Um, what would happen is that rather than being able to refi and pull out 100% of the initial equity, which is what we think we're going to be able to do right now, um, you know, perhaps we'd only be able to pull out 50 or 75%. Um, but certainly um, our loan to value on the debt is so low that I mean, we'd have to have a 50, 50% correction um, to even have an issue paying back the lenders. Um, so there is, you know, some risk that the equity partners are taking with us, um, but, but most likely that's going to be a question of, you know, do we get back all our money or do we get back half our money or three quarters of it um, when we refinance? Um, certainly not, uh, you know, uh, terrifying problems. Those are still pretty good good questions to have to ask. With the uh, with that in mind, we've uh, definitely come towards the back end of our time today. I want to say thank you again for. Uh, your time today and, and helping to understand this project in much greater detail than uh, than, than I did originally. Uh, just with with last uh, last question in mind, there's oh, there's two last questions I want to address. Uh, first, what does 2017 look like for Direct Source Wealth and Cura Golden? Um, so, Direct Source Wealth has had an amazing transformation this last year and has really gotten legs of its own um, with the emerging of our advisory board and um, the cementing of our executive staff. Um, the company is really moving along nicely in its own right. Um, and uh, so, I'm continuing to hold the vision for its future. I'm continuing to support um, high-level planning and strategy um, but I'm looking, you know, five and ten years out, um, whereas the executive team is looking, you know, towards this year and next year, and um, our management team is looking at, you know, next month and next quarter, and, um, you know, so we've we've really created a structure that's going to allow DSW to continue to grow. 
Um, and personally, what that's done um, is freed me up to focus on what else we want to do um, as a brand. Um, and so, you know, DSW at the end of the day is not a real estate investment company. Um, we do real estate investment. Um, it's our hammer. It's our tool. Um, but at the end of the day, we are a lifestyle and um, family wealth company. And um, so, you know, you need the real estate to make the money to build the passive income to, uh, it's like putting coal into the into the train engine to make the train go. Um, so we do that and we've built that structure, but now the next step is um, building out, what does it look like to support an investor? Because believe it or not, when you become independently wealthy, when you don't have to, do something every day anymore uh, to pay the bills, um, depression can set in um, or a little, you know, not the first week, you know, or two, um, but, you know, when you realize you don't have to get up out of bed and you hit snooze a few more times on your alarm, um, it can get to be a little bit different. Um, so the next step is supporting our investors um, in – figuring out who they are as, a, as an independently wealthy person. Um, it's creating uh, travel opportunities, community service opportunities, um, social interaction amongst our investors, um, asset protection, wealth planning. Um, so these are some of the next steps that are necessary to continue to support our investor base um, as they grow. So, you know, you don't get into DSW thinking, oh, I'm just going to invest in a deal and make some money. Uh, you get into DSW because you go, hey, these are the tools that are going to help me become independently wealthy. And then when I'm independently wealthy, I need a community of other independently wealthy people to go out and do meaningful things with and make an impact with. Um, and so that's the next step is, is building out the support systems um, for our investors to, to be able to do that. Last question, and it's a two-parter. And I'm stealing this from Tim Ferriss, whose podcast I absolutely adore. And uh, two-part question. What was your favorite what, – what book are you reading right now? And what was your favorite book in the last 12 months? Um, I have to read multiple books simultaneously. Um, it's something about the way my ADD brain works. Um, so I am currently working through 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, which has been incredibly helpful. Um, at the same time um, that I am rereading Think and Grow Rich um, and um, also uh, rereading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and, oh, and Bondage Breakers. Um, so those are, those are, I guess, four books I'm sort of simultaneously working through. Um, and last 12 months? Or overall? I mean, I don't mean to sound cliche, but quite frankly, um, going back to the Bible regularly, um, Every time I go back, so I, I, when I read scriptures, I, like, I have different times that I do it. I have times where I'm doing it for personal insight. I have times where I'm coming to scriptures intentionally looking for professional insight. Um, working through Proverbs has been incredibly helpful for that. Um, you know, but uh, there's uh, such a wealth of knowledge in how to um, structure um, a business um, that, that, I mean, that's definitely the singular most most helpful resource. And, and I forgot to give a shout out to um, Coach Mike Jarvis. Also, I uh, uh, was just out at my reunion at GW and he was there and um, kindly signed a couple copies of his book, uh, Head Coach, or Everyone Needs a Head Coach. Um, and uh, that's that's been a wonderful book too that has highlighted in particular this scriptures that really recorded. do help uh, with leadership development. Now, you've been in this deal for quite some time so far. The uh, Your acquisition of Dayton, I guess it wasn't originally called Bridges of Pine Creek, but you know the acquisition took place uh, at least a year and a half ago from what I understand. Um, why so long? Isn't this a stale deal at this point? Why would someone want to jump on it? 
That's a great question um, and one we really consciously considered when we made our model. Um, so when we bought this property, it was February of 2014. Um, we didn't actually begin construction until September of that year. So we've been just over a year in construction. Um, but um, uh, we, uh, there was a lot of pre-work and negotiating and stuff that had to happen before, that, before we could break ground. Um, but what we've chosen to do as a model is what we call sort of just-in-time funding. Um, we couldn't do this if we didn't have the strong relationship with our investor base um, that we have, that, that you know, we know the, the flow of capital um, that comes in pretty regularly. Um, but the, the benefit of doing this um, this way is that we're only paying for money as we need it. Um, so a lot of times when you're paying, you know, a 12% interest rate, a hard money interest rate, um, ha traditional hard money lenders out there are going to um, earmark that entire amount of capital um, because they want to know that you have all the capital there to finish the deal. Um, but then you're going to start paying on it right away. So the cost of capital is very, very expensive, and there's this real pressure to get a deal done fast. And um, I think that pressure systemically has created more problems in real estate, uh, worse decision making, um, and uh, corners being cut more than any more than any other systemic issue. Um, so we've consciously chosen to do this funding where we're funding only about two months out on a project, and we obviously keep reserves to make sure that we don't you know run out of money, and we, we monitor all that stuff very very closely. But it allows us to. Um, be much, much more cost effective and therefore pay a higher return to our investors um, and, uh, you know, complete the project at a fraction of the, of the carry cost. Um, so, you know, the ability to bring in the capital as needed um, is really, uh, really valuable for having a successful project um, and being able to position correctly no matter what market we're in, no matter how the market changes. Um, no matter what we have to do to make sure that we see everyone to a successful landing all the time. Thank you. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get this posted and uh, get some excerpts out there for uh, for for the crowd to follow. And uh, you know, look forward to hearing about uh, the rest of your success on Bridges of Pine Creek and and uh, DSW in general over 2017. You know, please stay in touch.